Every service, I'm thankful that God shows up. Every service, I'm thankful that He is here in a strong way. Because everything we do, if, if it's not for, this, for the presence of God showing up, let's just go home and eat some bonbons or something. We need His presence. This, that is what makes the difference when His presence shows up and moves. And I honor you all for being here today. I honor you that made the drive out Thursday night as well. It's always a challenge to get yourself out of the house and get to the house of God, but it is always well worth it. Amen. You know, the old uh, the verse says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. And I've heard it said before, and it is true that, you know, the best, the best moments of my life have truly been in the house of God. You know, I've been, I was born and raised going to church and I met my wife in the house of God. The first time that I seen her, she walked in the back door of the church and I said, woo, look at her. <laughs> it was the best thing that happened. I, I received the Holy Ghost in the house of God. I, my sins were washed away in the house of God. Every good thing that has happened in my life has been in the house of God. And it's not because of a building, but it's because of Him and His presence. And I'm thankful for that, amen. And that's why I'm excited when the doors are open, am I able to make it to church? Of course, today I'm the pastor. It'd be kind of awkward if everyone showed up and I'm like, oops, I'm not there today. But before I was pastor, I wanted to be in the house of God. It was just my life. It's, there's no greater place to be than in his presence. Amen. John chapter 17, verse 14 and 15 says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray. <clears throat> That you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I'm going to speak this morning on this subject around me, but not in me. Amen. If we could just take a moment right now to ask God to bless this word. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your presence. Thank you, God, for your spirit that is in this place. God, I pray that you would just move upon every ear to receive your word today, God, that you move upon me, Lord, to deliver your word, Lord, anoint this vessel of clay, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, let everything be done according to your purpose for your glory in this house, so God, we pray. God, we need you, we desire you, we want you, Lord, to move in this place mightily in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In 1957... A ship was commissioned to be built and started construction later in the same year of 1957. It was finished in 1958. I'm not sure if anyone here has heard the name of this ship, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. It's kind of a legend in more of this section of the world. Um, but there was a song that was written about this ship that made it even more of a worldwide legend than just a Great Lakes legend. But this ship was built 70, 729 feet long, 75 feet wide, 39 feet tall. Can anyone say that's big? <laughs> Huge. It was, for a while, it was the largest ship that sailed on the Great Lakes. And when this was built at the time of being built, it was worth $7 million, which uh, is equivalent to $50.3 million in 2020. So it was... It was quite a feat. It was quite a ship that was built. It was a freighter of taconite or tassonite uh, ore pellets, and it had over 27,000 ton capacity. A lot of core of ore on the ship. This, during its lifetime, the ship made 748 round trips um, of delivering ore to uh, place to the plants that were going to manufacture it into iron, and in the, the it made about 47 trips per season. So that, this thing was busy. And throughout its lifetime, this ship, it, had, it broke many records. It set records and then would break its own records. It was, you know, the amount that it would carry and the speed that it went. It went to about 17 miles an hour, which in a car, that's not much. But in a ship that has 27,000 tons of cargo, that's a lot. That's, that's fast. So it was, I mean, this was quite a feat of engineering when they built it. And of course, it was you know, one of the largest, so it gained notoriety even in the time it was around. It was called the Pride of the American Side, and the Mighty Fitz, and the Toledo Express, because it many times went from uh, Superior, Wisconsin, to Toledo, Ohio. 
called the Big Fitz, and it was also called the Titanic of the Great Lakes. It had many different names, and you know the, the uh, captain knew that people liked it, and of course he kind of realized that there's some notoriety with it, so he would, when he's going through places where there's a river, where there's closer towns, he would have music playing through the PA system to kind of drum up the, uh, you know, they called him the DJ captain. He would drum up the, you know, the, the, the tourist attractionness of it, if you, for lack of better terms. And he would also sometimes, when he noticed there was coming to a place where there's people around, he would get a bullhorn and start talking facts of the ship to the people as they passed by. You know, he kind of played it up a little bit, hammed it up. Uh, but he was a very famous captain, of course, because of how he handled this ship and everything. But we know there was a song written about it because of this, that on November 9th of 1975, this ship was sunk in the Great Lakes. Um, that night, a storm arose. It was a first listed as a small storm, and then it was a gale, and then it was, okay, this is a big storm. It quickly escalated. Um, there was waves that were rising up to 25 feet high. The Anderson, which was another ship that same night that was traveling close to it, that recorded gusts of wind 81 to 86 miles an hour, and it recorded a couple waves over 35 feet tall that hit that ship and then went on toward where this Edmund Fitzgerald was. It was quite a night, quite a, a storm that picked up that night. And these long, you know, and then in the middle of it all, it started to snow, so of course it's less visibility yet. The waves were crashing, the snow was flying, the winds were crazy as a sustained 57 to 68 miles an hour winds with gusts up to 86 miles an hour. This is quite a storm that the ship was, fly, was sailing through. Throughout this storm, the, the Anderson and the Fitzgerald, they kind of kept in communication. They were at one point about, they had been close, and the Fitzgerald was faster than Anderson, so he had pulled away and was about 16 miles away, but they could kind of see each other at first, and then got to the storm was so bad they couldn't see each other, but they were within radio contact, so they were talking back and forth, hey, how's it going, and um, they kept up the conversation. Uh, but then the captain of the SS, Edmund Fitzgerald let the Anderson know that uh, he was taking on heavy water that was over the deck in one of the worst seas that he has ever experienced. He was saying that this was bad, and he said he had a bad list, which means he was leaning to one side, and also he had lost both radars, and this was just a few minutes, and then there was one more communication, and he where he said, we're, we've got this, we're okay, and then after that, communication was lost, and once communication was lost, then the Anderson was trying to locate the ship on its radar and couldn't locate it anymore and started to call the Coast Guard and say, hey, I think something happened. And history lets us to know that, yes, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald had met its demise that night. It sunk to the bottom of the sea, broke in half, and all 29 crew members lost their lives that day. They never even found the remains of them. Tragic ending to the ship. But... There's a lot that we can learn from this ship if we look at what happened there. One thing that struck me the greatest was they called this ship the Titanic of the Great Lakes. And they even said, well, it's kind of unsinkable. It, it can handle a lot. Brought my mind to the word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, 12. says, now all these things happened to them as exampled. And they were given for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore... Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I never, never want to get to the place where I call myself some great giant that can't be taken down, where I call myself an unsinkable ship, where I say, you know what, they have fallen, but I'm, I got this, I'm good. No, I'm never going to be in that place where I think that I'm unsinkable, that I'm unstoppable, because I know that I've got to take heed lest I fall. Paul said, he said, I'm going to be careful lest I preach to others, yet myself become a castaway. Paul, one of the greatest writers of the Bible, one of the greatest apostles that walked the face of the earth, he also knew he was not an unsinkable ship, that he had the propensity that his flesh could take over, that he could fall. So Paul said, I've got to be careful that I don't fall. And so we can never be in this place where we start to call ourselves a Titanic, which that sounds good at the onset but the end of the Titanic and the Titanic of the Great Lakes, the end of both of them was not good because they didn't take heed to themselves. 
They didn't look out for themselves. They got a little comfortable in themselves. Now, there's a, quite a few factors that contributed to the sinking of this ship. And yes, this is on the mind because it sunk on, uh, I think it was February or November 9th, and so it was, we just came across the 47th anniversary of the sinking of this ship. Um, but there are some factors that they, in hindsight, they looked and they're able to list some factors of why this ship sunk. And I think that this is something that we can take a lot of lessons from. Number one, complacency. They had done 748 round trips successfully. The crew knew how to work together. The, the captain knew the ins and outs of that ship. He, they had just become complacent. When things were going on, they didn't, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't think it was as much of, a, of an issue because you know, we've, we've weathered storms before. We can handle this one. We're okay. They got complacent. They got, it was just routine. It was just another day. It was just another sailing. It was just another, another storm. We'll be all right. We've, we've uh, faced storms before. We're going to be okay. But they got complacent and they weren't as watchful. They weren't as careful in the running of the ship. And we'll cover a little more of that later. There had been some earlier damage to this ship that they had ruled as inconsequential. There's some earlier damage that they had looked at and said, ah, it's, it's not that bad. A couple times it had run into the, the side of a channel. Once it had collided with another ship, it had run aground at another point. Other crew members who had been a crew member for a while and left, they said, you know what, we could see the stress cracks in the sides of the ship and the paint in certain spots. You could see where it had been stressed, it had been, but this had earlier damage that hadn't been addressed that possibly could have contributed to the sinking of the ship. And you and I in our lives, we've lived a life. We've been tossed, we've been toiled, we've been, we've been beat up sometimes, we've had some collisions with other people in our lives, and we need to know that I can never look at earlier damage and think, well, I'm just going to ignore it. I've got to take everything to Him. I've got to take everything to the cross. I've got to, whatever has happened to me to damage this ship, I've got to say, I cannot sink. So I've got to make sure that is repaired. And how do I do this? Casting your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. I've been beat up. I've been bruised. I've been broken before. I have some cracks. I have some stress fractures. Well, what am I going to do with it? I'm not going to just ignore it. I'm not going to, I'm going to go back to the one who made me. That ship should have returned back to home port and said, you know what? You made me. Repair me. I'm going to go back to the one who made me and say, you made me. So I'm calling to you to repair me because I know there's a storm coming someday. There's a threat coming someday that I may not survive. So I need you to make me whole. I've got to go back to him with everything. What did he say? Come unto me all who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He's calling out for those who are broken. He's calling out for those who have some wounds, who have some damage to their lives. He's saying, don't just live with it. Bring it to me. Come back to me. I'm the one who created you. In your mother's womb, I saw you. I formed you. I know you, and I'm the one who can repair you. Bring it back to me. We cannot just ignore earlier damage in our lives as they did. Increased load was another factor contributing to the sinking of this ship. The more you, the, it seems every year that you get older, there's just that much more you have to deal with. You know, I remember, you know, my, about my son's age, being 14, you're just dreaming about the day you get to drive. Then when you're 16, you get your license, you're just dreaming about the day that you can graduate. Enjoy those years. Because how many of those days you sit around with absolutely nothing to do? What am I going to do? Hmm. I guarantee you, I never have a moment where I sit around and say, is there anything that I could possibly do? No. <laughs> There's some increased load in my life. But I've got to understand that there can be a breaking point in my life. So I need to, you know, sometimes say no to things. You know what? I, maybe yesterday I took 27,000 tons, but today I can't take 27,000 and 100 tons. I need to, I, let's lighten the load. Let's go 26,900. Let's... 
let's back it down a little bit. I cannot allow my life to become so overloaded with the cares of this world that it sinks me. I cannot allow my life to be just weighed down and bogged down so much that I can't even take care of the things in life that I need to take care of. Maybe if they didn't have such a workload of things to handle, they would have got the, the damage taken care of. Maybe they would have had time to, but the increased load in the, in the ship, we don't have time, we can't stop. We have another load to take, and they have more. We gotta go, we, gotta, we can't stop. Don't allow yourself to get to this point. I know that's, that's a very, you know, maybe carnal point, but we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect ourselves to know that there's only so much that I can bear. There's only so much that I can handle and know your own breaking point, know your own abilities and don't keep on loading yourself up. It's time sometimes in our lives to say no to some things because of what is important in our lives. Pastor Soto in Appleton was preaching one time about um, relationships and he was talking about all the different relationships we have in our life and he made a very poignant point that stuck with my mind and has never left. He said, you know, we need to look in our lives and understand that some relationships are rubber. They can handle a couple drops. Some relationships are glass balls like a Christmas ornament. They can't handle it. And we need to understand my family, I, that's a glass ball. My immediate family, that's a glass ball. I, that cannot afford to be dropped. That cannot, if I'm juggling, I'm going to drop one. It's not my family. I need to put them first. I need to say they're the first ones. Friends, you know, we all have lives that we have friends. We, sometimes we, we have some drop balls. We, we can bounce back. We'll be okay. But family, that's the thing that cannot. And so I cannot have, allow the increased load to take away from what's right in my life. And my relationship with Jesus Christ, that is a glass ball that I cannot at any point afford to drop. Because the moment I drop it is the moment the enemy is going to come in. So I've got to say I cannot overload my life so that my Jesus, my family, those that are closest to me are being dropped. I cannot take on too much load. Let's learn that lesson from them, that I've got to watch my loading in my life. The SS Fitzsimon had also had no watertight bulkheads. And this goes back to the complacency that they had these great doors that would go over the hold where they would pour this ore, bed, these ore pellets down in. And when the ship was found on the bottom of the sea, they said that usually when they find a wrecked freighter that carried the ore, they would find that these latches were all busted apart. But this one, many of the latches were still intact, which means that they hadn't even been latched. They were just, they had just shut the doors and hadn't latched them down. They had said, you know what, we, we've sailed before, it takes time to latch them, it takes time to unlatch them. We're okay. There's some things in our life that we have got to have buckled down, that we cannot allow there to be anything that's loose in some areas of our lives, the areas of doctrine of the, of the Word of God, the areas of understanding who God is, the areas of prayer and, and Bible reading, we've got to have these locked down in our lives so that they cannot be knocked loose. Because these bulkheads that were supposed to be watertight were allowing water to get into the hold. It was allowing things in instead of holding things out. And when you're a freight ship, there's some things you have to hold in. Because there's also things that you need to keep away. That's the point of these bulkheads, to keep the ore inside, to keep the elements out, to keep certain things out and keep certain things in. I've got to have some trap doors in my life that are closed tight. I'm not going to allow the doctrine to slip away. I'm not going to allow my personal devotion to slip away. I'm not going to allow my, my, my time with God to slip away. But I'm going to have that door shut tight because I'm not going to allow certain things in. There's some things in this world that I'm not going to allow in. So that door not only protects what's in, but it keeps what I don't want from getting in. So I've got to say every day, let me check my latches. Let me check that I'm holding on to truth. Let me check that I'm holding on to what's right. Let me check that I'm not allowing the things of this world in. Because what does the Bible say? The enemy cometh not but to seek and to steal and to destroy. He wants to find that open door into your life and get in there and take you out. There was another ship that I read about. It carried uh, gypsum, which they used to make sheetrock. And it was carrying a large load of gypsum. And it was going through, uh, down the ocean, and it had a conveyor belt system inside that when it would dock, you had this conveyor belt that would unload it out the side door. 
Well, the Coast Guard helicopter was flying over and noticed that that side door wasn't closed correctly and also noticed that, hey, you guys are low. You're sinking. You're, 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 you're not up where you should be. And because that side door was open, water kept on getting in the ship and they didn't even realize they were sinking. And this Coast Guard called to them and said, hey, you're sinking. And he had actually turned on a video of this, you know, some video footage of this, uh, this ship to watch it and said, hey, something's not right here. Called to them, you're sinking. No, 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 we're okay. We're not sinking. Within minutes, that ship, that ship just disappeared out, in, out of view into the ocean and sunk to the bottom. We cannot allow there to be some openings in our life. I've got to keep things tight. I've got to keep things locked down. And thank God, Brother Bishop Booker preached it on Thursday. Thank God that there's voices in my life that can look at me and say, hey, you're a little lower than you used to be. You're sinking. You're, something's not right. Look, I see an opening where there shouldn't be an opening. And I've got to be listening to them voices and saying, hey, if you're saying this, maybe it's true. So I'm going to check it out. I'm not going to say, no, I'm okay, but I'm going to check it out. Amen. No watertight bulkheads. I've got to keep it locked down. Another thing that hurt this ship that contributed to the sinking was not enough instruments. Not enough instruments. Sometimes on the ship, they, they think that they can navigate by different things, but when you navigate by the stars, what about a cloudy day? You've got to have more than the stars to navigate by. You've got to have other things in place in that ship to know where you're going. And this is one thing that they suffered from on that ship was there wasn't enough instruments that when radars failed, they didn't have a sonar, they didn't have a depth finder to, to rely upon, they didn't have other things to rely upon to to let them know where they were. They didn't know if they got into shallow water. They didn't know if they where they were heading because their radar was knocked out. So they, they lacked, they, they needed more instruction of where they were going. And in our lives, we can never have enough understanding where we are. We can never have enough understanding of where we are in this world and what's going on around us. And I'm, I'm not talking about reading the news every day. But I'm talking about where is my soul in connection with this world? Am I staying afloat? Am I keeping myself separated? Am I keeping myself so I'm not being tainted by the world? Am I keeping myself from places that I can run aground, that I can experience shipwreck? Am I keeping myself from where places where I'm going to run into something? I've got to have those instruments in my life. And what is that? If we're led by the Spirit, I've got to be full of the Spirit that's leading me and letting me to know. Because that truly is the depth finder for our sh for the ship of our soul. That's definitely the, the radar that lets us to know what's ahead. So I've got to follow the leading of the Spirit that's going to let me know, don't go here, do go there, Just take left, turn right. It's going to let me know the safe path in life. The other thing that they suffered from was poor navigational charts. After the sinking of the ship, the Canadian uh, people who measure the bottom floor can't remember the exact name. They did another reading of the floor and they found out that there's a shoal that they had written on the charts that actually extended a mile further than they, they thought. And the shoal is just a piece of ground that sticks up underwater and is shallower in that little place, kind of like a hill underwater. Poor navigational charts. They realized that, whoa, there's more under the surface than they thought. There's more going on. We have got to have the Word of God be hidden in our hearts. Because there's things out there that if we only know little bits and pieces of the Word of God, there's things under the water that's going to try to take us out. There's places we're going to get into that we can't get out of. We've got to know the entire Word of God. We've got to study the Word of God. What's the Bible say? Study to show yourself approved that you may know. I've got to know. I cannot just fly by the seat of my pants and think, well, I read this one chart and it says I'm good, so here, let's go. But I've got to say no. Hey, I need to study. I need to know where I'm going because if I don't know, I can sink. Amen. These are some of the factors that led to the sinking of this ship. But in my research reading about this, one of the greatest things that I found that struck out to me was that the, what they carried on, this, on the load on this ship was this taxonite ore pellets. These were actually porous. And they found that these porous pellets can actually absorb eight pounds of water per cubic foot. So while water's getting into the hold, 
it's not just draining out and being pumped up by the bilge. It's making the ship heavier and heavier and heavier. And water's not just coming and flowing through and, and flowing. You know, the waves crash over. Waves are going to crash over the side of a ship. But they have things in place the, that can keep the water rounded out. And they can pump it out of the ship so that they can stay afloat. But this ore that was in there was absorbing and absorbing and absorbing this water and taking in more weight and making it heavier and heavier. So now 27,000 tons turns into how much more because it's so weighted down. Philippians 3, 18 and 19 says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. When I'm going through life, storms are going to arise. Things are going to happen. I've got to have something in place so that I'm not becoming swamped with the storms around me, so that I'm not becoming overladen with the things around me. Because what does the Bible say? Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. You know, maybe I'm not falling into gross sin. But maybe I'm just letting so much of the world in. I'm absorbing so much of the world that I'm becoming weighted down. And I don't realize it. And that weighting down, that's all it takes. That's bit by bit, more weight, more weight, more weight until I'm sinking below the surface and I can't make it anymore. I've got to know that I cannot have my mind set on earthly things because if my mind is set on earthly things, I'm filling myself with the world around me that's trying to swamp me, that's trying to take me down. The world around me, and that's where Jesus said, you know what? It'd be nice to take them out of the world. Let's get a plane and fly that over, over top of the water. But no, that's not what he's called us to. He didn't call us to be taken out. We're the ship that's taking things over the water. I'm on the water, but it's not in me. It's around me, but it's not in me. And I've got to be careful that the water, the storms of this world, the things of this world, the temptations of this world, they don't come in and, and overtake me. And weigh me down. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I've got to constantly be letting God's mind be in me. Because what happened with Jesus? He was different than the rest of the people around him. He was different than his disciples. We read the story where he told them to get into the ship and go to the other side. He says, I'm sending you forth across this lake. You're gonna, you're, I'm telling you to go to the other side, so you're going to make it. You're going to be okay. But just get in the ship and go. And a, a mighty storm, Eurocladon, set upon that, that lake and starts blowing. And they're all fearful. And the same thing as the fit, Edmund Fitzgerald. The water was crashing over the sides and getting into the ship. And they're all afraid and crying out. And what are we going to do? We're going to die. But then here comes Jesus just out for a stroll, walking on the wave tops. What's up, dudes? What, what was the difference? The storm was around the disciples, and it was getting in them. It was swamping them down. It was making them fearful. It was getting them just to be afraid and getting them to be swamped down. And they, they were, how can we make it another day? We're going to sink. This is going to take me over. But there was a different mind in Christ Jesus than was in them. And he said, you know what? I'm on it, but it's not in me. It's around me, the waves are crashing, the water's spraying everywhere, but it's not in me. I'm on top of it, and that's why I've got to have the mind of Christ in me. Because yes, I'm facing storms in this world. I'm facing the waves of this world that's trying to crash over and take me down, but I've got to say, I'm not allowing it to get inside of me. Those hatches that we talked about are so much more important when we understand that inside my soul, I will absorb something. I'm going to absorb something. I, it's impossible for me to live in this world and not absorb something. What am I going to do? I'm going to be full of the presence of God. I'm going to be full of the Word of God. I'm going to be full of the right relationships that I'm supposed to have. I'm going to be full of righteous living. I'm going to be so full. Ever take a sponge and get it full and then pour some more water on it? What happens? It just pours off. It just goes around it. That's what I've got to do inside of myself. I'm so full of God that the world just runs off of me. There's no room for it in me. It can't fit in there. Amen. And this ship, they got lazy. They got complacent. 
And instead of taking the time to batten down the hatches, as they say in ship talk, and locking them hatches down right, they said, we'll be all right. And in that storm, the water was getting into the hold, and it was absorbing that water. They couldn't pump it out because now the hold is absorbed. It's full of the water, and it's saturated. They can't get it out of there. And I believe the weight of that's enough to just push that thing right out of the water. There's no more buoyancy left. Because what was around that ship was now in the ship, and it couldn't make it. And that is what you and I need to understand. I will sink when what is around me becomes inside of me. I will sink when the things around me in this world are so ingrained into me that you can't really tell the difference. That is when something loses buoyancy, when there's so much water inside of it that there is outside of it that it just there's no more displacement of water. It just sinks because it's full of what's around it, and that's why it sinks. You and I need to understand this world is trying to get into us. It's trying to, to completely remap us and to, to get us full of the things of the world. And we may say, you know what? It's harmless, but is it a weight? Is it a saturation of my soul that's going to weigh me down? Amen. Romans 12, 1 through 3 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world. What's he saying? Don't be filled up. Don't look just like the world around you. That ship, eventually, you looked inside of it, the same water that was on the outside was the same water that was on the inside. It was conformed to the world around it. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And this goes back to the point about being called the Titanic. I'm not going to think more of myself than I ought to. I know that God has given me a measure of faith. That is the only reason why I could even begin to believe in him when he called for me. Is because he dealt to me that measure of faith. And what am I going to do with that measure of faith? I'm going to cultivate it. I'm going to grow it to the point where my ship is now secure. Where that measure of faith has gotten me to the place where I'm believing in Him. And I'm studying Him and His navigational chart. His Bible is my, is my, is my guide. His Spirit is all the instruments that I follow. And I'm to the place where I'm a secure vessel that can make it through any storm. Why? Because I don't think of myself as I can make it. But I know that I transform my mind. Why? Because I have faith in God. And so I, I go to Him daily saying, Lord, transform my mind. Don't allow me to be conformed to this world. Don't allow what's around me to become inside of me. But let, let me be different from what's around me. Let the, the world look at me and say, hey, there's something about you that's different. It's okay to be different. It's good to be different. Because the things around us, it's all heading to destruction. It's heading to, to a path that is not right. It's heading to hell. That's the end, destruct at the end of the story. It's good to be different from the world around you. I do this because I take the faith that he's given me. I build it up and I'm conformed and I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm transformed so I don't look the same. I don't act the same. Amen. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which were above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. We've got to be careful. We can get too many emotional connections to this world, to the things around us. We can become emotionally involved with this world where it begins to dictate how we feel. Brother Mike was joking with me about his football team losing this morning. But he's still smiling. I'm sure he had a little, oh man, moment, but he's still smiling. Are you going to make it? Are you going to be all right? One, one day at a time. <laughs> <laughs> we can't allow ourselves, and I'm joking on that, that matter, but the things of this world can get so emotionally 
attached to us and the storms of life can get so into us that we're emotionally connected to it that that weighs us down. Uh, if I allow my mind to be set on the things of this earth, it's allowing that earth in. It's allowing the things of the earth in. And that's a weight that my soul cannot handle. That's a weight that I cannot handle. I, I cannot make it with those extra weights. So I've got to say, I'm going to set my mind on the things above. I'm going to set my mind on the things above. I'm not going to allow myself to be so intertwined with this world that it becomes who I am. We cannot allow ourselves to have intellectual connections with this world. You know, it's good to get an education. It's good to learn. But I keep that in its right spot. I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting an education. I'm doing the things I need to do. But my greatest intellectual understanding is from the Word of God, is from the Spirit of God. It's not from the things in this world. Because anything that the world teaches, anything that the world pushes, it's a system of the world. And my mind is not supposed to be set on the things of this world. So I've got to say, you know what? I'm going to keep it in its right spot. You know, a ship, the Edmunds Fitzgerald, I guarantee you they had a water tank. I can guarantee you they had a water tank. They had to have some water on board to, 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 for the supply for cooking and for drinking and taking showers and all. They had to have water on board. But they said, you know what? It's not really the same water that's around me. It's a different water. And it's not going to overtake. It's in its spot. It's in its place. I heard a, you know, Pastor Soto one time was preaching about relationships and fires that are built when people are dating. And he said, you know what? We had a fire at our house last night. It was blazing and hot. But it was in the fireplace. It's where it's supposed to be. It wasn't in the living, middle of the living room floor. Now the whole house is in the fireplace. It's where it's supposed to be. And that's where we need to understand. The things of this world... We're in the world. There's some things we have to take in. I cannot do my job without taking it in, but I keep it in its place. Because how many times have you ever experienced where you're learning you know, work-related training and then all of a sudden something else has slipped in that's just a system of the world? Keep it in its right place. And know that that's, you know what, that's that tank over there. I use that to, because I have to live in this world. But it's not who I am. It's not saturating me. It's not filling me up. It's not becoming my identity. Amen. I've got to be careful of my emotional and intellectual connections to this world that my mind is set on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Because this world, you know, the Bible talks about the spirit of Antichrist. It is work out, it is at work already. We talked about this somewhat yesterday at men's breakfast. The spirit of Antichrist that is at work in this world already. What's it doing? It's working on you and I. It's working on every one of us. And the Bible gives us many indicators of what this, the spirit of Antichrist is. Unthankfulness is one we talked about yesterday. It's, that's a huge part of the spirit of Antichrist. And it's these things that get into us. And it talks about lawlessness. It talks about... Um, uh, i trying to remember the other word I was thinking of. It talks about many different things. Just, yes, there's all the, the vulgar lifestyles that are part of the spirit of Antichrist. But there's also these not quite so bad seeming things. But at the end of the day, it's just building up a system that the Antichrist can work in. And that is what this world is around us. Would it like to have one hundred foot tall wave crash over us and take us down? Yes, the enemy would love to do that. But he knows that... You know, when, it, when the person's a captain, they, they know when there's going to be a roadway. They, they can read the seas and know what's happening and get to safety. And so many ships are not taken out by this huge... Most ships are taken out by the little trickle, by the little bit that gets in. It's, it doesn't seem like much, but over time, the ship is lower and lower and lower. And eventually it loses its ability to float. It's the little trickles that the enemy is getting after us with. And we have got to guard ourselves. We've got to guard everything about us to say, I cannot allow what's around me to become inside of me. I'm going to set my mind on the things above. I'm going to set my mind on heavenly things. I'm not going to allow myself to be bogged down with the systems of this world. I'm going to renew my mind daily. I'm going to check the hatches daily. I'm going to check that I'm not becoming complacent. I'm going to check that you know I'm, I'm on the course that I'm supposed to be on. Am I following the right charts? Am I following the right navigational inputs and signals? Am I following the things that I'm supposed to? Am I following the presence, the Spirit of God? Am I doing what I should be doing in life, or am I just 
floating along and allowing trickle and trickle and trickle to come in. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. We live in this world. Paul talked about it. He said, you know what? I wrote to you not to have fellowship with these types of people. But he said, I meant in the church. Because if you had no fellowship with those type of people, you'd have to go out of the world. We can't go out of the world until we're called home. Uh, different cult groups have tried it throughout the years to go out of the world. It doesn't end right. That's not what we're doing. I know that I, I, I'm on a direction. I'm on, a, I'm on this water top. I'm on this surface. I'm, my ship is sailing towards one destination. That's the New Jerusalem. But on the way, I'm sailing over troubled waters. I'm sailing over waters that are trying to take me down. And even if I'm not saying yes to gross sins. Am I allowing too much of a trickle of that world to get in me? Am I allowing that? Is there a hack somewhere that I didn't quite batten down good enough? I'm not spending enough time prayer. I'm not spending enough time in the Word of God. I'm not spending enough time focusing on my relationship with Him. Is there somewhere that there's a, an open door that's allowing things in? Am I not guarded in a certain area of my life? Because I cannot afford for this ship to be sunk. I cannot afford to be taken down by the weights and the sins of this world. Amen. So today, if we could come forward, I want to open the altars today. For anyone who wants to come pray and talk to God. Let's just do some soul searching. Let's do some checking in of ourselves and saying, God, renew me. And you know what? Maybe I've become saturated with the things of the world. It's okay. The altar is a great place to cry out to God and say, renew me, cleanse me, purify me. Any, anything that's in me that's weighing me down, Lord, take it away, clean it away, Jesus.